Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Kennedy Center Family Theater. We'd like to remind you that the use of photographic equipment and recording devices of any kind is strictly prohibited. Also at this time, we'd like to ask you to please turn off all cell phones, pages, and texting devices. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming out this evening. Tonight is part of a two-part series of discussions that we are having as part of the Nights at the Opera celebration here at the center. Last week, we had uh, an incredible interview between our president, Michael Kaiser, and Terrence McNally. Um, and if you didn't get a chance to be here last week, I highly encourage you to go onto the website, kennedy-center.org. Click on the Explore the Arts tab at the top, and you can watch that interview from last week. It's very fascinating. Tonight, I am very pleased uh, to introduce the panel that we have here, but first, um, I'm going to bring out our moderator. Please welcome from the Washington Post, Mr. Peter Marks. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, I think we're in for a, a rare treat tonight. I can truly say that. We have not only the masters of McNally here with us, we have the McNally All-Stars with us. And I will introduce them to you. We're going to uh, talk about the life and times of Terence McNally as seen by these terrific actors, um, all of whom have um, performed at the Kennedy Center. Many of them have uh, collected bags of Tony Awards for their performances. And um, why don't I just introduce them? First, we have the consummate uh, classical and uh, actress uh, who won a Tony Award for, among other things, Master Class, uh, Terence's play about Maria Callas. Uh, uh, so let me introduce, please, uh, Ms. So Caldwell. Following that uh, burst of uh, enthusiasm, uh, he's not coming out. We'll skip right over him. Uh, a quintessential McNally interpreter has been in several McN McNally plays and is currently in the Kennedy Center's production of the Lisbon Traviata, won a Tony Award himself for Love, Valor, Compassion, playing two characters uh, written by Terrence, evil tw an evil, a, a pair of twins. Uh, Please come out, John Glover. <laughs> Boy, it just it just it, it just rolls on here. It's it's kind of amazing. Next, I feel like you know I feel like a little like uh, Conan tonight. Um, uh, next, we have an actress who has the distinction of winning Tony Awards for both straight and musical performances uh, uh, involving productions uh, written by Terence McNally. Uh, she won a Tony for both Ragtime and for her performance with Miss Caldwell in Master Class. Now on the uh, TV series, I think it's on ABC, Private Practice, <laughs> Ms. Audra McDonald. Alphabetically last <laughs> is a gentleman who's had a remarkable career of his own um, uh, from a very tender age as a television actor and as a stage actor. Um, he is probably best known uh, uh, in the McNally world for his performance several years ago as a um, maniacal opera conductor um, uh, in the Stendhal Syndrome, also did the Lisbon Traviata in Los Angeles. Yes, yes, you know him as John Boy Walton from many years ago. I'm sorry to say that. He's probably annoyed at me for even mentioning that. But uh, now on Broadway in R David Mamet's race, Mr. Richard Thomas.
From the maniacal John Boy Walton to the <laughs> maniacal <laughs> conductor. Well, my work is done here. I'm leaving. Um, uh, uh, it is truly a privilege to be on stage with four actors whom I admire and I've gotten to write about in my own career and, and, and I've admired many of their performances. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the work you've done with a certain uh, gentleman who's being featured uh, in, with three productions in Washington right now. Um, but I wanted to first ask you the question because I, I found in, in doing a little research about Terrence myself, um, I spoke to John about his uh, uh, obtaining the role of uh, Mendy in the Lisbon Traviata that Terrence, the way he got the part basically was Terrence called to him and hounded him uh, to take the part. <laughs> Um, I was talking then to Tyne Daly about her role in, um, in, as Maria Callas, and it turned out in the course of the conversation that, uh, how did you get the part? And, well, uh, Terrence called me, and uh, I, I had to say yes. Then I read, I looked back at my own interview uh, from years ago with, um, with Zoe, uh, when she did uh, Masterclass in New York, and it, uh, it mentioned it about the 15th paragraph that you know, she got the part when Terrence asked her to play the role. <laughs> so my question to you guys is, is there anybody who doesn't get a role in the Terrence McNally play by being called by Terrence McNally? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you, how did you, you, you were in, Master Class was your first experience with Terrence? Yes. Um, that was a, a, a part that uh, uh, was both a dramatic and a singing role. Uh -huh. um, was there something special about your first uh, encounter with Terrence? Um, um. I, um, Terrence, I'm having, uh, now I'm having trouble remembering, but I think that the chronology of it went that I audi oh, I got the call to audition, you know, my agent submitted me, and then, um, I realized what I had to sing, and I freaked out, and I canceled my audition. <laughs> and then they called back and said they've gone through one round of auditions, they didn't really find anybody, well, you consider going back in. I was working with Shirley Verrett at the time at Carousel, and she said, oh, honey, that's a hard aria. Are you, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> so then I, she helped me, and I went in again, shaking, and, um, and then afterwards, um, and Zoe, you were at the, were you there? You were, were you, I think you were there. Yes, yes, what you, happened though? No, no, you were there. <laughs> you, were, you were there, you were all very, very lovely. And then I left and I thought, well, you, yes, you were all very lovely, especially you. And I thought, well, I, I didn't get this. And then when they called me to say, you have been offered the role, then that's when Terrence started hounding me. Then he, <laughs> he came to see Carousel. Do you remember this, Terrence? And then you took me out for grilled cheese sandwiches at the Lincoln Square coffee shop. And you and Lenny just kind of told me why I had to do this role. Do you remember that? Where are you? Oh, he's hiding. But yes, that's, I think that, and that's how it happened. Then I got hanged. <laughs> it does seem, there does seem, you know, I, I, it's almost as if you're not a real New York actor until you've done a McNally role. Um, there's something about um, the specialness of the relationship and also his recognizing in actors a talent, a skill that he wants to um, incorporate into his plays. I mean, he wrote Masterclass for you, did he not, Zoe? Yes. And, um, uh, <laughs> short answer, is, is, that not, is that not a thrill for an actor to have that kind of, to have to, a writer of that caliber say to you, I need you to play this part? Yes, but he doesn't really give you that option. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he said, I want you to go to um, Big Fork, Montana, fly into the airport, and I'll meet you there, and I'll give you the second half of this play that I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to my husband, Robert, I said, Robert, do you know what Terence wants me to do? He wants me to fly into Big Fork, Montana, <laughs> meet him at the airport, and then he will give me the second act of this play that he's writing called Masterclass. And Robert said, go. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. Richard, you, uh, uh, you the same way. I mean, you had done, you, you obviously became a McNally actor, and, and by the time he asked you to do that role uh, in Stenholm Syndrome, well, Stendhal Syndrome. I had, I had two near misses on musicals with Terrence, two musicals which Terrence had done the book, and, and um, 
one I was supposed to do and that didn't happen. And then he said, you owe me a musical and sent me another script and that didn't, and that didn't happen. So then he said, I'm sending you a play. And it arrived, the manila envelope arrived at the house. And I said to my wife, I said, you know, it doesn't matter what is in that, <laughs> in that package. I have to do this play. Mm. <laughs> and thank God it was just one of, the, one of the best parts I ever got to play in my life. It was a feast. Um, uh, John, you won a Tony, I mean, it is kind of extraordinary that, you know, how many Tony Awards are, are, are given out. Not that everything's about prizes, Richard, but, uh, but um, uh, uh, oh, oh. So. I got the other prize. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you did. No, and God love you. And, um, but uh, uh, there is something extraordinary about a, a, a writer who can create those kind of bravura roles, those roles that you, that get you um, to another level in your, in your profession. John, I mean, he wrote twins for you, um, correct? I mean, the twins in well, Love, he, Valor. He said, but, but first, first I got to tell you that I got the first Terrence McNally play because I called him up and asked him if I could be in it. I didn't know that. Yes, so. <laughs> oh, which that was Lips, lips together, together, Teeth Apart. I had Another seen break. the production in New York and, uh, and loved it. I knew they, he, they did his plays at the Music Center in L.A., so I got his number and called him up and asked him if, if they did it in L.A., if I could do that part. Uh -huh. And he let me. That's great. But then he said he was hearing my voice when he was working on this new thing, which turned out to be the, this dream role of these two but twins. That's what I mean, but what's that yes. for an actor? That has to be an extraordinary It's the best it's ever. The best. feeling. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's the right, best. Nothing like it. A writer say they want, and a writer, you know, a, not someone who's looking to ride your coattails particularly, someone who wants to use you because they know, you know, you can do it, and also this is a person who really can express themselves, you know, through character. And Terrence is very collaborative, too. I mean, Terrence, I think, listens, you know, as I, I know when we were working on Masterclass and all of its different incarnations as it, as it was coming into to Broadway, um, you know, I, I remember there specifically being a part at the end of Masterclass where what Maria was saying to Sharon was... It, it was it was devastating, but not as devastating as it, not any more devastating than anything she had already said to all the, the students mm. at, up to that point. Mm. <laughs> and we were rehearsing it. I can't remember where, if we were in D.C. or in L.A., but we were rehearsing it, and um, and Terrence said, "It's not enough to get you to where you need to be, is it?" And I said, "Well, I think I think it's not the worst thing in the world that she could say to Sharon that would really devastate her, so that Sharon would turn around and give that indictment." And so Terrence went home and wrote something incredibly <laughs> devastating, yeah. saying, you're not special. Yeah. You, you need a gift from God, and you don't have it. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say to someone. But it, it gave me what I needed. And that's what I mean. He's, told, he's he, you know, as, as brilliant as his words are, I don't, he's, he's one of those playwrights that is not necessarily so married to them that he gets blinded with his own ego and his own work, you know, that he mm. can't see. Yeah. You know, that as we, as we have to in, inhabit these characters, he understands that we, we bring something to the table to help him understand the character more as well, and he listens. And he does listen for vo voice in the rehearsal room, yeah. and even says, so um, now that I have everyone in the room, I can hear everyone's voice, and I can begin to work on, work on the play hearing these actors. Mm -hmm. It's got to be, you know, I, you know, I romanticize it maybe a little, but I, I got to believe that, you know, creating a character, you know, to know you're the first person that's going to go down in theater history, that this was your character, forget what accolades come or whatever, all that, all that sort of excitement, that, that sense that you're involved in the, the origins, the creative sort of beginning, um, how collaborative is it with a playwright like McNally? Do you... Do you get to tell him that something's not working? Uh, do you get to, uh, you know, edit? Is or is it is it like you know he's the words and I'm the you know I'm the person? Well, I created two parts for Terrence, in, and in Stendhal Syndrome, it was, I mean, when I when I read it, you wouldn't change, you wouldn't change a comma, you wouldn't change a, I mean, it was absolutely, I mean, I became like a dog over his dinner. With that script, I thought no one's getting me. <laughs> no one, no one, was no. Um, <laughs> until they call places. <laughs> but uh, and, and but with the most recent play of Terrence's, I did unusual acts of devotion. Um, there was the wonderful. There was a great a great play that came to, to be, you know that, that we started with, and then to continue to have him work on the play and uh, knowing that you're the first actor who's going to play the part. It's a it's a wonderful wonderful feeling. 
it's a, it's a great, great, you know. I mean, you know, dead playwrights are in some ways easier to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got the dead playwrights, but there is nothing, nothing like, like um, working with and collaborating with a great living playwright, I think. So did you, um, uh, uh, I, Terrence told me the story that uh, you did a scene from A Perfect Ganesh, uh, an earlier play that you had been in. Oh, to honor him. Correct, and that over that dinner, or wherever that benefit was, he wrote on a napkin basically out the beginnings of Maria Callas and Master Class, if I've got that story right. Yes, um, that's what he says. Um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, you, so did you uh, have any terror about playing Callus? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. I, okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Tell us about your terror. Yeah, please. <laughs> we want to hear. We want to. No, really, was it? Um, well, yes, and he didn't make it easy <laughs> because uh, he couldn't understand that I could be so musically inept. <laughs> <laughs> When we were in Big Fork. <laughs> you were literally in Big Fork, Montana, doing Maria Callas? I'm not quite... Yes, we were doing a reading. <coughs> Why in Big it? Fork, Montana? Because they had something called, what did they call it, uh, the club or something, and they all <laughs> met and, and playwrights went and they, or like musical, they did a little bit of, uh, they worked for two weeks there. And my work was just to, I just lay on my belly in this dreadful motel. <laughs> <laughs> Indoor, outdoor carpeting because it was used by fishermen. <laughs> and I was trying to learn phonetically how she would sound. I had to do that every night. I would do it for like three hours, just there, there, do it, do it, do it, and then I'd feel so good in the morning. It wasn't good enough for Terry. <laughs> But he does the writing, you see. That's the most important thing. It doesn't matter how sweet the playwright is. It's when they write like that. Mm -hmm. And you follow their direction. You said, um, so, in, I, re I read my own story, and uh, <laughs> you had said, you had said that you good. took, yeah, yeah. Uh, how was your punctuation? It was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it, it held up. The story held up. And uh, uh, you said in that piece that you, um, when you talk to acting students, you said that your advice to them, and it's a very, it's a lovely, um, simple, it seems, direct bit of advice, but yet very profound. You said, you know, your job is to serve the playwright. Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes. Which is He's the artist. She's the artist. Where, like... Uh, not servants, what you call priests and priestesses. Mm. We're taking the word of the playwright to the audience, and because we're following the punctuation, we're making them cry and laugh just where the playwright wishes them to. But I always found, every, I read a play, every day I read the play that I'm going to do that night, right the way through for punctuation, actually, because the stage manager can say, Miss Corvus, oh, we put on three and a half minutes. Right, what, 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 would it all be me? Yes, it's all me. <laughs> <laughs> so I would go back to the punctuation, and where I had taken a full stop, because it was nice to take a full stop, cut it out and go straight on wherever it's, it's supposed to be, and you take up to three and a half minutes like that, because you're serving the playwright. That's, that's the real, real nub of it. And there are only three things you need. You need a playwright and an audience and some actors. Directors, singers. <laughs> that's New stuff economic times. Thank you, that's very helpful to know. Uh, does that ring true, this, this idea of serving the playwright, do you, you know, I, I wonder how much actors coming up today feel that 
that sort of sense of mission that the words are kind of sacred. Um, do you? It's not that they're sacred. The punctuation is sacred. <laughs> <Right>. uh <-huh. laughs> not the words themselves necessarily, but in conjunction with everything else, they're the ones who know how to do that. That's their score. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't take on Mozart without his score. Mm. You don't take on McNally without his score, or anybody, actually, if they're good enough to do the playwright, to do their play, observe them. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. I would imagine most young actors you know, feel that way about plays. Yeah. But being in the yeah. room with being in the room with the playwright, if they didn't know it up to that point, they'd learn it then, and <laughs> figure it out very quickly. There seems um, to be a, a playwright who is who is as clear as Terence can be at certain moments about what where the where the beat is, how it's it isn't this and it is that, and he's can be quite outspoken in rehearsal, and it's very helpful. And and it's no matter no matter how. Um, how good a friend he may be, and he makes a great friend um, in the room. He'll say anything right. <laughs> about. I mean, really, no, it's right. true. He's he will right. say he's it's. Right. He's and and after a performance, he has he has no. Um, it's not personal. It's mm -hmm. not. But but he's absolutely honest, blunt, and clear about what he feels is working and not working. Yeah. So he makes it very clear to you whether you're whether you're on the page. Can that be not. can that be wounding? I mean, can that sometimes can, can well, that if you kind want of to the playwright, of course it can be wounding if you feel that you're not. But actually it's just great. We get so manipulated by people so often in our business. It's just so great to be in the room with someone who just tells you the But if you don't take it, you just have to learn not to take it personally. You don't take it personally. It's, it's about, it's it's about, about the, the work. Yeah. It's about the play, yeah. and you want to be told the truth. You don't mm -hmm. want to be treated like a child who has to be kind of helped to the thing. You, want, you need to just be told. Mm -hmm. but you, you know, don't, don't you find that most of his, the, his texts are so musical anyway, yeah. almost yes. like a score? Absolutely. And I, I, when he called me about Lisbon Traviata, it, I, I didn't call him back for two weeks after he called because I was terrified. Mm. First off, because Nathan had done the role. Nathan he made Lane. a big mark doing it. And I've worked with Nathan and seen him, and he's one of the best we have. And I thought, I can't do a role that he... And, and that I knew nothing about opera and nothing about Maria Callas. But one of the things that... But I had this intensive love affair with her, and I, now I, I, mean, I spent months just sort of pouring her into me. But what you were saying about the way you feel about the text and what, how she attacked all those operas, she called it, I mean, she was such a disciplinarian. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, she called it straitjacketing. And she would first say you learn the text, the exact text, and then you go and do what you have to do. And I, see, now I'm not so intimidated by opera like I was. I feel, I mean, I still don't understand the music part of it, but. But, but I, well, you know, I understand the passion of it now and, and how to, uh, I mean, I have to work harder because I, what was my point going to be? Is I it, had a really is good it, point. Is there an adversarial d dimension to a relationship with the playwright? I mean, is there? No. Uh, in the sense of, you know, you are, you're an obstacle to the degree that you're not producing what he wants. I mean, or does he have to be as, you know, as flexible as you are? Does he have to be, allow for the possibility that you're going to bring something that he well, didn't Well, it's a symbiotic expect. relationship. You can't, yeah. you know, the playwright, you know, unless he, he's planning on getting up and doing it, you know, you need, <laughs> he needs us just as much well, as we need him. But the yeah. answers the are in his text. <laughs> he, it, it's all there in the text, all the hints and the clues. Like, like when you're doing Shakespeare, he put it all in the text mm -hmm. for you to, yeah. to just, you know, the puzzle's there. You just. Do you get to say, what do you mean by this? I mean, is, it, is, oh, that, sure. is that fair game? You better. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't know. That's when it's great to have a, a, an okay. alive playwright. God bless you. Because <laughs> yeah. you can ask. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Instead you of having 500 other sort of... Just ask. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's okay not to know. It's great not to know. Yeah. Sometimes. In, re in rehearsal, it's really great not to know. Yeah, it's, it's a luxury you have that I don't have. I'm, you know, I'm so totally wrong most of the time about what a playwright <laughs> intends. That, you know, it's, it's, That's you know, not true. Well, I'm j I mean, it often feels that way. You know, I mean, it's a, what a playwright mm -hmm. has in mind you know, sometimes uh, get so misinterpreted. Can I ask you a question? Uh, is that on a first viewing, or is that over time, over viewing a play over time? Yeah, sometimes if I've seen something two or three times, I certainly get yeah. a, a whole different sense of what was imagine. intended. Because you're so, you're never quite, the first time, you're, sometimes you're just trying to figure out who everybody is on yeah. the stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes, it sometimes takes that long to sort of, it's, it's um, some, some critics go back you know, a second yeah. time if they've got the luxury. Because uh, it in, certainly in takes occasions. rehearsing a play, 
putting a play up and doing a play to really know a play. Mm -hmm. And that can take a very long time. Absolutely. I felt like um, we didn't really know Masterclass. So I remember you and I talked about this with Masterclass. We, we did it in Philadelphia, and then we had a couple of months off. Then we did it in LA. We had a couple of months off. Then we did it at Kennedy Center. We had a couple of months off. Then we went to Broadway. It's great to let a place settle. Like and that. I feel like up until the end of the run, when you and I left, uh, like the week after the Tonys, I was still finally, you know, really settling in and understanding what the play was about. And by that point, it had been almost two years, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, and that's... I can imagine. Uh, I, I mean, I, there is this wonderful luxury you guys have when you're working with McNally. I mean, you can, you know, you can find out. You can ask and discover, which is, you know, you're, you know no one gets that sort of, uh, that luxury outside that rehearsal room. Um, is he uh, uh, ever sort of, is there ever an, at odds with that director who Zoe doesn't think is important at all? Um, um, uh, <laughs> do, you, do you ever sense a, um, you know, <laughs> do you ever sense a, uh, a contentiousness between him and the director? Have you ever had that experience or is it mostly been? No, I'm so busy trying to find out what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. Mm. No, I've never noticed that. I've had the experience of being of being in the room with Terrence when 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 there were uh, th where there was the struggle to make the and when I say struggle I don't necessarily mean between the director and the and the playwright but the struggle they were engaging in together to to be on the same page about what about what was or what, if a play or if a director would have a particular suggestion for a cut or something and then Terrence would say yeah you know you're right and then it would say no that's got to stay in absolutely but that's this is the, this is the process mm -hmm. I mean everybody gets it's amazing that they get the plays get put on the stage at all <laughs> you know it requires a great deal of, of mutual good faith but that doesn't mean it, it can't be contentious you know you've all had you he know listens you know so that's the thing mm -hmm. you, you, you think about how many playwrights you can name who have a track record these days, you know, who, go, who, who you can talk about four or five plays. That's or, the thrilling thing yeah. about Terence. Mm -hmm. Terence writes like playwrights used to write. Every year there's a play. That's what they did. They were playwrights. Terence is a playwright. That's mm -hmm. what he does. He's, uh, it, it's a marvelously reassuring thing to have in your midst. I also wanted to say, this, this show runs, this is a two, this two and over and two hours? Yeah. Two, and a two half. plus two and a half. Okay, so You're talking you know, about golden age. Which yeah, is I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm out of school a little bit here because I'm, I'm right now doing a play that runs 90 minutes, including the intermission, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and 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 feel a little bit with these the, the 90 minute sort of default structure that we find all the time now, like we're contributing to the uh, attention deficit disorder of the theater going <laughs> public. <laughs> 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 Not that that not not that it's not great to get in and out in ninety minutes and have a great because some plays should be but I mean would O'Neill O'Neill and and uh, I mean where would we be with some of these plays? Um, but Terence when Terence writes a play you get a full on meal of a play. Mm -hmm. He's not afraid to have the audience sit in the theater and and take take part in the play long enough for the play to sink into your system and sort of get under your skin in a way that a play can't quite do in 90 minutes. You live in it and, and the play begins to live in you. So he's not afraid of these long forms and two and sometimes three act structures, which is very, very courageous and, uh, and there's not enough of it now, I don't, I don't think. And producers well, are terrified. Well, there's enough of it. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? There's, what? Enough. No. there's, there's enough. enough of it. <laughs> she means enough of the... Seems like I'm always going to the theater and I think, my God, it must be two days. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's true. Nothing is longer than a bad long time. <laughs> but there is, you know, there is truth in that. And there, I mean, there is, there aren't that many stage writers who you can point to who are, you know, pushing these issues along. I mean, there's just, you know, there are how many plays on Broadway? For any of you, are there roles in any given season? I mean, you've all found work elsewhere successfully too. Sure. But how many how many times a year are there things for you guys that you know? That's what's so marvelous about him doing the plays here. Yes. One, two, three, because it's like a company. It's mm -hmm. like his company. Yeah. Great. Uh, uh, I mean, Audra, you're doing television now. Uh, mm -hmm. John, I saw you on Smallville. I mean, you're. I mean, it's you're playing somebody's father. I'm uh, dead now. You're dead now. <laughs> 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 
You look great. You look real good. My great. son pushed me out my office window for this story. <laughs> I brought him up well. In Smallville, you were so you're Lex Luthor's father. Daddy. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and uh, Audrey, Audrey, you know you've you know you've you know every it seemed like every year you were walking up to the Tony uh, podium yes. in the in the nineties uh, to collect another Except one. Say in the nineties. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Back way back in the olden days. I meant that, that was actually when I was covering theater in New uh -huh. York uh -huh. for the Times, and so I would, you know, it was like, oh, Audrey's nominated again. It was, you know, everybody clear out. Um, but you did do um, *Raisin in the Sun* just a few years ago on Broadway. Yes. With P. Diddy. Yes. Well, yeah. What was? It? Uh, yes. Sean. Um, Sean. Uh, <laughs> you know, do you? So, so do you guys? But does does have you know? Um, and John um, and Richard, you played a, you know an iconic character on television. Everyone of a whole two generations knows who John Floyd was. But um, <laughs> no, I didn't. I'm trying not to. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I know, but you don't want to. It's know, not a problem. I don't yeah. have a problem. With All right, good. All right. Um, but does that burnish your reputation? I mean, is that something that becomes makes you more marketable to come back to the theater? I mean, is that something that that it becomes a selling point? Unquestionably, especially now when producers are more and more interested in opening shows with stars from other media. You know, one wonders where the careers of Julie Harris and Colleen Dewhurst would be right. in the present climate. People who are actually stage actors, you know, who are dedicated to the theater, who are great stage stars, but not necessarily stars in other media. It, it, but, it, but if you do have to happen to have that feather in your cap, yes, it's, uh, it, you'll, you'll get offered stuff. Um, I, I think that uh, as far as doing other, other things, you know, I mean, it's like the National Endowment for the Arts does not support our careers in the American theater. <laughs> you know, we don't, we're not, the actors' lives in the theater are not subsidized. We have to subsidize our lives yeah. in the theater, and we do it in a number of ways. Uh, what it is. Well, I, I, I'm curious. I mean, being on a show, uh -huh. like a network show, you know, it's, there is a certain, there is a certain sort of in the theater world, bragging rights thing when, when somebody does well and moves you know and, and, and gets on a hit show I don't think it's just that people think you're supposed to be you know but you know just that's earning. interesting I don't I don't think let, let, me, let me put this in the right way uh, I, it, it can be but I also think that because I, and I'm not saying that I don't respect uh, television actors and 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 what that medium brings and what you what skills you have to bring to that medium um, but a lot of times I find when, I don't know if you found this when you went off to do Smallville, uh, theater people would get a little like, what are you doing? Are you, what, 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 are you leaving the theater? What's happening? Where are you going? You know, I mean, it's, um, but, but Richard's right. We have to, we have to subsidize, you know, for ourselves. So I, I, um, it, it, in some ways it can be looked down upon to go off and do TV. Yeah, I, I, I think that, I mean, that is the sort of standard sort of, you know, the conventional wisdom is that, oh, that, you know, you're, You've left. Not, you're not using all of your skill. But, yeah. but they all want to get that part, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they all want to get that call from the agent. But you know what, there's, I mean, I don't think there's ever any, well, I mean, I'm sure there are some cases of leaving theater, but I think for those of us who sort of kind of grown up in it, or once you get bitten by the bug, I, you know, Try and keep me away. You know, I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll do a community theater production of, you know, whatever. I mean, I, there's there's something that's so um, addictive about that kind of holy communion between the the playwright, the actor, and the audience that uh, I mean keeps us coming back. Audrey just sang in the Sondheim 80th birthday celebration in New York. Sang a great Sondheim song. I wish I'd heard it. Too many mornings from Follies, yeah. which is extra and, and and Richard was there. It was so beautiful. John, I mean, is that, you know, I mean, is, is it this, this issue of, you know, of, of like the, the language of television versus the language that Mc, Mc, uh, McNally sort of creates? Is there, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, but what is, what is that for an actor? I mean, is, what part of you are using when it's, you know, it's television writing that you don't, I, I don't know. I mean, did you feel that Smallville was well written? <laughs> That's a lot of a question there. I, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> But what's the you know what what's the difference? What's for you in terms of a, what what part of you is fulfilled um, doing 
you know, Mendy and Elizabeth Traviata versus doing, and I'm just saying, I'm asking because, you know, you spend, you devote, you have to devote a good amount of your energy to yeah. creating a character like um, a, a television, a non, a, you yes. know, a regular character. Well, that, that was the challenge, using what, what I was given to, to make someone who was written sort of as a cartoon villain, not a, a cartoon and not a villain. So, right. and I think I succeeded in it. I confused people in the street. They didn't know whether I was a good person or a bad person. So I thought, well, I'm doing what I wanted to be doing. Mm. But every hiatus, I went and did a play. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and and does, it does the one feed the other. Does the other, does it make it, does it make you more marketable? I mean, is it more important that you did Smallville than that you won a Tony in Love, I don't Ella know if it made me more marketable, marketable, but it made me happier. <laughs> so, and that's yeah. the important thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, teleplays, and with the exception of some great screenplays, are, are not so much about language. And plays for the theater are about language. So you can't, there's really no comparison in terms of what, what, what the menu that you have, what you're given to work with. It's there, you know, an episode of a, it's, they're telling stories, but it's, it's not really telling stories through language. And the great thing, the thing about any great playwright is they have a particular voice. Yeah, you there's often a sound, there's a voice, there's a rhythm, there's, a, there's something, there's lyricism if it's Terrence or Tennessee, there's uh, something if it's Edward Albee, there's something. And uh, that voice gets in your ear and gets in your head, that rhythm, that cadence, and you begin to in interject the, the, the qualities that that playwright has and you long to get back to it and do it again. Mm -hmm. It's very different from the kind of writing that you do when you're, when you're working in front Yeah, of the, the richness of the language. I, and I there are exceptions, you know, they're, they're great screenplays. No, 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 absolutely, and they're great TV series and, I, right. I, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, I, read, I read Lisbon Traviata recently and I was surprised, not surprised, but, but really um, entertained by how fast language sort of, I absorbed it and how it, it all sort of went through me and in this wonderful rush. Oh, that's great. Uh, you know, and that's like, you know, I realized, you know, reading a play is not the easiest, a lot of people can't, you know, it, right. it's like, it takes a long time to be even to develop, um, I found even in this job, the skill to read and hear different voices in, in, in dialogue mm -hmm. in your head. But I find um, that play, it just, you know, I was roaring, I, I was laughing. Sorry, John, I, I know I'm not trying to put pressure on you. I mean, cause, I mean, I, I mean, it's, you know, I mean to tell you that, you know, I laughed at the script for it, but I, I, I found it hilarious, yeah. you know, in a way that was so uh, cathartic. I just, I, I made me read through it like, you know, it was like, boom. And I, you know, how many writers do that today? That's the beauty of Terrence's work too. He, you, you know, he, he writes such engaging characters and you you know just they're they're kind of in the little observations they make about life you end up observing something about them and you're laughing and laughing and laughing and then two seconds later he turns on a dime and you're you're sobbing well that's the thing i was going to say it's good terrence he's very smart he gives you lots of laughs because at some point <laughs> in the evening you're going to have to go to a place that you just don't want to have to That's go right. to. You know, there's ultimately in each of the characters, there's a place where there's no shade. Mm. And I always say when I pick up a new play of turns as I start reading, I think, oh, where's it? Where am I, where, where am I going to have to go now? Because you can run, but you can't hide. Mm. One of the things about his plays, do, doing them that's so great, is that everybody gets naked in Terrence's plays, if not literally. <laughs> um, it's like, what, what did somebody once, well, if he can't show it on stage, he'll write about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's true. You have to get, and then not just in a sexual context, but so you get lots of jokes. Mm -hmm. You get to have lots of laughs. You get to really entertain and engage the audience because you're going <laughs> to, what you're going to pay. Yeah. <laughs> because you have to go to a, you have to go to a very tough place at some point. And it's one of the things that I think makes him a great playwright. Mm -hmm. There is, there is a, there's pain in those plays. There's a pain. I always. I it started with Lisbon and Traviata, I think. How so? How so? <laughs> the second. Oh. Robert and I went and we were, we just fell down. And they, they, Terence was in London. And so we had to ring him right then and tell him that now he'd suddenly moved to another mm. level of writing, mm. which he did. 
in Lisbon Traviata. I mean, it was extraordinary what happened. It's kind of vulnerability that the characters in the second have. part, it's yes. Fiercely, they're fierce, but they're vulnerable at the same time. Um, Zoe, uh, Terence told me that, I mean, he had seen you do, I mean, he was, uh, you know, devoted to you, to you as a performer. I mean, he had seen you as an actress do, I think, All's Well That Ends Well. Yes. Uh, in 19... Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, back in the 90s. Yes. The, yes. Uh, that's right. Uh, About and, 70 years ago. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, it, it's, it, it got hold of him, it seems. You got into his system and he's, it seems as if he spent his whole lifetime, you know, dealing with that. And you're in there. You know, he wanted, it became something he wanted to write for you. You know, it, uh, clearly that became something very important and personal to him. You know, Lynn Meadow mm -hmm. uh, rang me and said, Terence has written a part for you in his new play. Would you be interested? And I said, oh, yes, I would, of course. And she said, oh. Uh, fine, then I'll send it to you. So I waited a month, and then I waited two months, three, <laughs> no play. So I thought, well, he's obviously written it for somebody else as well. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I didn't even think about it anymore. And then one day, somebody from Lynn Meadows' office rang and said, we're having the reading of the play. It's called uh, A Perfect Ganesh, and we're having a reading of it on Friday. I said, aha, well, it would be good for me if I could read it before. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't come. It didn't come. Right up until I was walking out of the building to go to the rehearsal room to read the play, did the concierge say, this is a, a, a letter for you, Mrs. Whitehead or whatever. And I quickly, quickly opened it in the taxi cab going down and I realized I was from Connecticut and that I'd lost my husband and that I had this great extraordinary thing. That was as far as I could go because I was at the rehearsal room and I went up and there were all the people sitting around and I thought, oh God, I can't read. I don't read. Do you read well? First shot off? No. Oh. And so I sat there and I thought, whoa. And they were so extraordinary, all of the actors. But because of the play, I laughed. Hmm. I'd make terrible bombs, and then I couldn't wait to get my bits out of the way so I could listen to them and watch them. And they were extraordinary. And I was weeping and weeping and weeping when we closed up shop. And I said, I know I gave a terrible reading, but if you'd like me to play, I'd like to play. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. And, and, and he did. And it was a wonderful, wonderful play. Extraordinary, profound play. Can you tell when you're doing a piece like a McNall? I mean, you know, can you, can you gauge during the process whether it's going to be a hit? And I don't mean a, a money hit, but no, just something No, you can as soon as the audience takes it. That's yeah. when you know. When yeah. The first the time you put it up before yeah. an audience, yeah. you know this play has a life, this play does not. Yeah. You can feel the... Oh, yeah. You can't tell, though, in rehearsal. You cannot tell The audience is the process. last part of the equation. You, you can, need the audience. You can tell in rehearsal if you've got a show that you're struggling to get right, right up until the last minute. Oh, that's and, okay. And that's perfectly okay, but you can't know whether that, whether the, that struggle is in vain or whether they're going to come in and love it. But as soon as they're in the room, yeah. as soon as they put their money Big down, Fork Montana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true, they were firemen and all sorts of people. And we did the reading. But they immediately got that play. They wanted to know what happened. They laughed. They were marvelous. They tell you. They tell you what you needed. Uh, not the not the invited dress. But what. <laughs> <laughs> it's when they start paying money. When they pay. <laughs> <laughs> Before I forget, I friends. think so that um, Terence told me that um, during an interview with with him that. Uh, in Big Fork, that you had the audience, I guess, some talk back with them afterwards. Once, and somebody raised their hand and said, 
uh, excuse me, ma'am, are you a professional? <laughs> and, um, and he replied very graciously, I, I think I'm telling this right, yes, I am. And he said, well, you should keep it up. <laughs> Memories. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> on the advice of that man. <laughs> uh, so, by the way, did you ever do television? Did you ever? No, no. Yes. You did? For the BBC, I did oh. quite a lot, a long time ago. Filmed that plays. That was about 90 years ago. Filmed plays. <laughs> <laughs> uh, rogue Harry's. I did sort of. Uh, I was being a young leading lady in those sort of serious plays for television. Mm. Mm -hmm. But I don't photograph very well. <laughs> uh, That's a bit of a John, drawback. <laughs> John, they made, they made um, Love, Valor into a movie. Yes. It, didn't, it, it, was, it got good reviews, yes. as I recall, but it didn't, it didn't break out, no. I mean, as, um, uh, uh, particularly. Uh, is, that, is, there something, the is there something, is, is Terrence, what? Oh, the movie. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they made master. Did master was there any ever talk of making master class? Oh, sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> really? Well, there was from. Uh, What's her name again? Faye Dunaway. Faye Dunaway. Faye Dunaway. Faye Dunaway. I think she oh, still has right. the rights to it. I, I thought I heard last. She made I heard a week. It, she. Worked. I heard she. She filmed a week. Yeah, they were they were filming in Detroit or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Every once every like every three years, someone will come up to me and say, "I'm playing Sharon in the movie <laughs> Master Class." <laughs> 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 but it's not. He, he's. Is, he, is it? You know. I know you're not all film critics, but um, is is he a is he a live kind of guy? I mean, is it? Well, is the? Is I had the great good fortune to do a wonderful teleplay of Terrence's called Andre's Mother on PBS years back. Then he wrote for television. Yeah. But that was written for yeah, television. That was written for television. Mm -hmm. So I and it was a beautiful. And I think that you. Won the, an Emmy for it. It was a oh, beautiful, really? yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Now there's 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 language writing for for the camera, uh, so he oh. can do both. Mm. But sometimes a play that is already a play mm -hmm. has a hard time making the transition. Yeah. Yeah. There's a heightened reality to theatrical writing, which That's is right. can def, can def, be problematic in front of the. And oftentimes you have to you have to bust it open. You know, plays tend to take well, place in very in specific. Mm. Once it gets on in front of the camera, who are not used to working with that kind of attack. Yeah. And, and for Love, Valor, Compassion, there was a kind of magic that happened on, in the theater because it was just a, a, a kind of a rolling hill, and uh, but it, it, was, it was so much in the imagination of the of what each person thought that it was this house that was a character that you never saw the house, mm. but it was spoken of so much and and then when we did the film there was a real house and and there was a great scene with the oh, two twi marvelous what you're saying what do you mean the difference between oh them. yes the imagination there was a real house and the things that the audience have to supply yes mm. yes weren't and there you have to evoke yeah, it yeah. from them you and the playwright and the music mm -hmm. Mm. I must ask, uh, Zoe, Zoe, sorry. <laughs> please, please pay attention. Please. Um, uh, so you, you were thrilling in Masterclass. You were thrilling. It was one of those experiences that you have in the theater. And I had seen you do other wonderful things, but that was a thrilling I saw it four or five times, and it was always thrilling. We found different things to do each time I saw it. And it did have that immediacy, that urgency about it, that performance. Um, do you want to act again on the stage? Is it something that you feel sort of? No, as long as I'm able to go to the theater and see marvelous theater, if I'm not seeing Marvelous theater, then I think, I think I should do something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. No? <laughs> uh, Audra, was it, I, I'm, you know, you had to 
face her down on the stage every night. Yes. Uh, you had not known Zoe before, no. Master Class, and that was, again, another amazing performance. I mean, you really, we had to bleed for you, mm -hmm. for what you were going through in that, in that production, that play. Um, was she that formidable on the stage? Did you feel that, you know? Being on stage with Zoe Caldwell, um, I, was, I, was, I, was I was afraid of her at first. Really? Um, just because I didn't know her, but I, 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 I knew the force of her and the, and the, the legend that was Zoe Caldwell, but I'd, um, you know, I, I, we were just getting to know each other and I was very polite and a little afraid of her at first. And, um, and then being on stage with that hurricane, she's like a, this incredibly powerful hurricane. Um, and it was like being in the eye of it in a way because it was just all this power around you and yet I felt completely protected in the middle um, and you couldn't help but rise up to your, your best game because she was, she was there on stage kind of demanding it. And, um, you know, and then of course I, I fell in love with her and I say to this day, she's the best leading man I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great line. She is. Ooh. Tattooed on my back, well, neck, and yeah. everything. Well, I do. I you, do. you do, but it's in Sanskrit. It's I mean, in Sanskrit. I, I, yes. Seriously, but but the other thing that's very. I'll moving. tell you one thing though. Please. On the odd night that Audra didn't play because she had to protect her voice, I wasn't nearly as good. <laughs> no. no, that's true. Oh, that's true. true. Lovely. But wow. and, and the other part of that is. You named your daughter. I named my daughter after her. Zoe. Uh, so there's Big Zoe. This, believe it or not, this little Zoe is actually Big Zoe over here. <laughs> and my daughter's little Zoe. And I, I got my daughter's name tattooed on my neck in Sanskrit last year. And so I have Big Zoe's so name tattooed on my neck. I don't even know just my name. <laughs> she can just look on the back of my neck. <laughs> it's right here, Zoe. It's right here. But yeah. And, it's, you know, and what the great thing about Zoe and that whole experience with Masterclass was... Zoe is really a creature of the theater. Not only does she know everybody's name in the theater, whether you are the ticket taker or the, uh, the crew backstage, um, she re replied to all her fan mail. She, she, she believed in you know, just the importance of that. She um, believes in her role as a mentor. It's not that she just has all this great talent, she's gonna keep it for herself and dole it out to the audience. She, she, was continually and continues to teach me to this day. She's someone who wants to impart her knowledge and sort of pass on the great tradition of acting in the theater and respecting the theater and being a creature of the theater. That's what's so magnificent about that. And so that's, I feel I learned so much about acting and theater and, and, and how to be, mm. basically, from Zoe and that entire experience with Terrence and all of them. I grew mm. up so much during that time. Mm. It was incredible time. Mm. John? You are the uh, at the pre at present. You are you are the uh, the only person on the stage uh, in a McNally play. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, We've what? got two previews. We're opening soon. You're reviewing the play, aren't you? Yeah. What yeah. am I this doing? Is, here? <laughs> this is very strange. Come on, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> it's, And what did you want to ask me? I wanted to ask you. What? Thank yes, you for pointing all that out. Thank you for, for pointing that out. <laughs> all right. Uh, but what, uh, John, what yes. are you learning <laughs> now about Terrence McNally? What, what is it, what have you discovered in this process that you didn't know before? Well, it's so interesting having delved into Maria Callas and seeing who she was uh, and understanding now and the way he feels about her and how important she was to his life, I, I, I see... Uh, I mean, I understand more about his passion, his, uh, his, I guess, musicality. The, uh, I, I'm, I was, I was ready. I didn't call him for two weeks because I was terrified to do the play. And, and finally, I just, when he, he, I got this message two weeks later, going, "All right, what do you, what do you do?" I mean, he was really calling me on my bad um, communication skills. <laughs> <laughs> so. I called him up and I just told him flat out how frightened I was. And he listened to my whole story and he said, well, isn't, when that happens, that means you're just supposed to jump on the challenge and go for it? Mm. So, uh, mm. you know, I mean, I learn from the man every day. 
He's a brave, amazing, fearless soul. Right? And I, you know, it, it occurs to me that you, I, I, maybe they planned this, uh, but you've each played, you know, a, 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 a facet of Terence's uh, fascination, love uh, for opera. Each yeah. of you mm -hmm. has been sort of a part of that. Yeah. Uh, does that, Richard, um, is that something that helps you in the performance, knowing that this man, you know, has this depth of, 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 of sort of love? Well, when you do any, yes, you can tell pretty quickly whether a playwright knows what he's writing about in terms of a particular topic or not. But at another, your, your, your question, all, I, I don't know that I have the right answer to it, but it reminds me of something about Terence's characters, which is related to opera and his love for opera. Terence's characters are what I like to call self-performative in a way. They're, they're not... They're not just, they're not schlubs caught in the, in the, in the, the grind of life. They have, they are, um, they're people with strong opinions. They're people who perform their, 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 what they believe in, who talk, who, who, who have a sense, even though they may not be performers or you may not be playing a performer, there is a performative quality. They, mm. they are, um, who they are in a theatrical way. And, and that has its roots in the kind, of, the kind of characterization you get in great opera, where they're not just characters in a play. They somehow are, they're phoenixes. You know, they're on fire with who they are. Mm. And, and uh, this, this quality of inner commitment to, to their own identity is one of the things that, when you play one of Terence's characters, takes you what you're, to another place. Yeah. Um, the, the characters take you up. It's like a, it's like a, it's like it's like surfing. Oh, I know nothing about surfing. <laughs> I imagine it's like surfing, but <laughs> we've been surfed on television. But they, it, it, they take you up on the crest of this wonderful performative quality that they have about themselves and bring you to a heightened place. And that reminds me of opera. Mm. To some degrees, there are operatic elements in Terence's plays, mm. and the fearlessness of the of the writing, emotionally and in, in every other way, is also part and parcel of the kind of larger than life, fearless quality that you get in opera performance. However, the feelings are always true and real. Yeah. Mm. They're never. It may be big, but it's always it always goes right to your heart, and it's authentic feeling. So it's a wonderful combination of authentic feeling and large performance, which I think has a lot to do with opera, even mm. if it plays that are not mm. about opera. When he was a little boy, he would, um, I'm not sure whether it was his mother who said, you take the great radio, and we'll go out in the car and listen to the, uh, to the field. Oh, I think it was that way. I think his mum made it possible for him to hear the really great sound. And when other kids were out just kicking a ball around, Terence was listening to opera. Mm. Terence was a little boy when he was doing that. So the passion is deep, deep, deep in his gut. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that that performative aspect uh, translates to other of his characters? I think you know that there are characters very, you know, non-operatic characters in a sense. I mean, you know, the characters in Frankie and Johnny couldn't be more kind of... Right. Oh, yes. No, of they relatable. all have it. They all, I mean, all have it. Yeah. All, yeah. all, all of them too. And the yes. stakes are always Huge. high. Yeah. That's what, what I saw. When I saw Lips Together, Teeth Apart, I think that was the first play of Terence's that I saw. Hmm. I can't believe I'd never seen one before, but I, I could, as I was watching it, I could just... I mean, there was this thing that started happening to me, which is why I called him up. I just wanted to be a part of that play, there was something mm. so passionate about those four people and what they were going through and the, the fervor with which they were going through it. Mm. Well, even the fact that Terrence, I remember we were doing some sort of benefit somewhere um, and he just had to write a, was it like a 10 minute play? Or, no, no, not even that, I don't remember. Where his first little germination for the idea of Deuce just came up, two ladies watching a tennis match. Mm. And you mm. riveted. Mm. And I, I was sitting next to you when, it was Zoe did it, and who, Zoe and Marion Seldes did it for that benefit. Remember a couple of years ago? Yeah, sure. The benefit, 
And after, Tom, you were, you were there, and I, I remember leaning, oh, I kind of like to take credit. I have no reason to, but I like to take credit. I'm the reason that Terrence turned that into a full play. <laughs> but I remember leaning over to him that night and going, you have to make a whole play of this. And Tom was like, you do, you do, you do. <laughs> but and that he was able to take just the most mundane sort of thing you could possibly be doing, watching someone else, you know, doing something, and make that, even that, riveting. Mm -hmm. um, because there's so much life within those characters. Mm. And even just them watching a tennis match, they were still filled with this fire, mm. you know. You know, we have to, unfortunately, wrap it up. Of course. Uh -oh. We're in trouble. Uh -oh. You're all fired. No, no, we're going to get those. <laughs> It's only appropriate that the playwright gets the last word. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Thank you to these actors. Good night. Thank you very much. <laughs>